first of all, thank you to Dr. Christoforou for the invitation to present our work uh, in intelligent and privacy preserving biometrics for student identity management in higher education. Uh, my name is Argiris Konstantinidis. I'm a research scientist in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Cyprus. And in this uh, presentation, I will present uh, our work, our research activities as part of a European project about uh, intelligent and privacy preserving biometrics. Okay, so to give you a quick outline of the, today's presentation, it's split in two. It's split in two phases. In, in the first part of the presentation, I will present an introduction to intelligent biometrics. And in the second part of the presentation, we will give the use case of the Trust ID project, which is a European funded research project for uh, in the context of higher education institutions. So the learning outcomes after this presentation include uh, to know the definition of what are intelligent biometrics. We will know how to list and which are the main categories of intelligent biometrics. And we will also understand some opportunities and some challenges when we design some intelligent user interfaces that are based on biometric technologies. So what are the biometrics? Based on the International Organization for Standardization, the ISO uh, definition, the biometrics relate to automated recognition of individuals based on their biological and behavioral characteristics. Also based on the definition from Wikipedia, the biometrics refer to the body measurements and calculations related to human characteristics. So for the biometrics to uh, work, we need some sort of biometric identifiers. And these identifiers are distinctive and measurable characteristics that are used to label and describe people. So the two main types of uh, biometrics are first we have the physiological and then we have the behavioral biometrics. In the first category of the physiological characteristics, uh, these relate to characteristics of the human body. So examples include our fingerprints, our face, our uh, DNA or our palm print <clears throat> or the geometry of our hand or even our iris in our eyes. So I'm pretty sure most of you already use some sort of biometric technologies, especially in your smartphones or in your laptops. So the second type of biometrics relates to behavioral characteristics of the individuals. And these are mostly based on patterns of the human behavior. And some examples include the way we move the mouse or the way we type on the keyboard. So each person has some sort of unique behavior that can identify them based on the way, the pattern they type or they move the mouse or the way they walk, for example, or based on their voice or their signature or their behavioral profiling. So now that we know the basic categories and the definition of biometrics, we need to go one step further to the intelligent biometrics. So what are these intelligent biometrics? This kind of intelligence introduced relates to mechanisms and methods that rely on artificial intelligence with the aim to identify or recognize or authenticate some people based on the analysis of these physiological or behavioral characteristics. So as you might have seen in some science fiction movies, there is this uh, uh, functionality that scans a person and grants 
access to a service or a facility. And these intelligent biometrics are mainly used for identifying people and for allowing control. So they give access to some people to either go get in a facility or get access to a system or a service online. So in this type of intelligent biometrics, the user needs to provide information like data about what they are. So this could be either face data or voice data or some sort of uh, uh, fingerprint or some behavioral uh, data like the way we type, for example, in order to get access to a service or a software or to proceed to a specific task that requires first to give access. Like when we want to make a payment, we might need to provide some of our biometric data. And the main idea behind biometrics is that they want to provide more convenience and better user experience rather than, for example, typing passwords <clears throat> or having to memorize long uh, alphanumeric characters. So some examples of these intelligent biometrics include uh, the Apple Face ID in which we present our face to the phone and there is this biometric technology implemented that allows access to unlock the smartphone and be able to, to use it. Or other examples include fingerprint uh, scanners on some laptops or some smartphones. And other examples include uh, the user identification, so identifying who a particular person is continuously, not one of uh, identification. And the last example is used in surveillance. So when governments want to do some sort of surveillance, they can use, uh, let's say, CCTV cameras that capture people on the streets and so on, and recognize the persons from the camera stream. Now, moving to the second part of this uh, presentation, I will present to you uh, our research work on as part of a European funded project, which is called Trust ID. And uh, the full uh, name of the acronym is Intelligent and Continuous Online Student Identity Management for Improving Security and Trust in Higher Education Institutions. A few words about the project before we get into more details. So this project, as I said, is funded by the European Union and is part of the actions of the Erasmus Plus 2020 framework, and in particular, the call strategic partnerships in response to the COVID-19 situation, partnerships for digital education readiness in the field of higher education institutions. Uh, the project runs for 24 months and it has started in June 2021 and will end in almost four months from now. It ends in May 2023. In this project, there are four uh, participating partners. The project coordinator is the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering from the University of Patras in Greece. Uh, also, other partners involved is the Department of Computer Science here in the University of Cyprus, the Institute of Systems and Robotics from the University of Coimbra in Portugal, and an ICT company that specializes in security and privacy software design and development, Cognitive UX GmbH from Germany. So what is this project about? As you already know, by the end of 2019, the coronavirus disease outbreak appeared in the world. And apart from the health issues and the bad things that happened in the whole world and the chaos that occurred, 
there were also problems and challenges in the higher education domain, in the universities and in general, the higher education institutions. So before the COVID-19 outbreak, <clears throat> most universities used a blended learning method, which combined both uh, physical presence of people in the university, as well as digital uh, presence in some occasions. So what, what were the challenges that were introduced to the higher education domain because of what happened with the coronavirus? So first of all, there was a need for continuously and seamlessly identifying students, but at the same time, preserving their privacy. And this had to occur in a way that doesn't interfere with the learning activities. So when you attend the university or a class in the university, your main uh, purpose is to learn something and not to worry about whether you will be identified properly or not. So that was from the student's point of view. We wanted a way to continuously be uh, uh, sure that the person, the student who interacts with the system is who they pretend to be. From the instructor's point of view, there was also a need to have some sort of insights, what's going on when uh, and a student takes an online examination, for example. And once these insights are presented to the instructor, then there is, should also be a way for the instructor to know what to do, what actions he or she might need to take. And another challenge involves the, the way the each higher education institution operates, as we will see, in a few minutes, <clears throat> it, there is not any uh, common, for example, infrastructure used for providing access to online examinations. So there was a need to provide some alternative uh, integration capabilities based on the needs of each higher education institution. So the vision of the project <clears throat> was to design, develop, and evaluate a multi-tier continuous student identification framework, which is adapted and bootstrapped to each higher education institution needs that will combine intelligent biometrics of face, like the image of the student, voice, and interaction data, the way the, when the students interact with uh, the online system. And all this needed to happen in a privacy preserving manner. So whatever actions and features this uh, framework will have must ensure that they don't violate the privacy of the students. So the core objectives of the project, as I said, was to design and develop an integrated framework for managing the student identity and also validate the solution in using a, a user-centered design methodology, which uh, involves the participation of uh, various stakeholders, both throughout the development of the framework and at the end uh, of the final version of the framework. And apart from the uh, development activities, Another objective was to create a repository uh, in which people, students, instructors, and system administrators could find relevant uh, material on best practices, some lessons learned throughout the process, and so on, with the aim to create a knowledge building. So as part of the project, we had four main intellectual outputs, the outcomes of the project. The first intellectual output was at a conceptual level and it includes the analysis and the validation of the conceptual framework. 
In the second intellectual output, we have the implementation of an open source software toolkit, which will be evaluated as part of the third intellectual output. And finally, we had the fourth intellectual output, which relates to the uh, learning material, the knowledge building, and this repository that will remain after the project ends and will enhance the sustainability of the findings. So how we started working on this project? First of all, we had to do a needs analysis and collect as much information as possible about the situation when the coronavirus started. So what were the procedures in the universities? How were students uh, interacted with, let's say, online examinations? I, I don't know if some of you had the opportunity to take online examination uh, during the coronavirus uh, period. But the first thing that we did was to collect all the information we could, so to understand better the problem, and then figure out how to proceed with the design and development of this uh, uh, toolkit. So, so what we did was, we first uh, did some literature review. Uh, we've seen what is going on in the world, in the research areas of the relevant uh, topics that were of interest. And then we had to verify that, uh, that needs that we found with the involvement of people from the uh, participating universities. Uh, so to do so, we conducted a series of interviews with uh, various stakeholders at the universities. We spoke to students, we spoke to instructors, we spoke to system administrators in order to better understand and verify uh, what we found on the literature. And the, our sample included 31 people from the three participating institutions. So for the verification, we uh, followed the three-phase methodology. First, we had the needs analysis during which we collected as much information. Then we verified our findings by speaking to the various stakeholders and verifying that we are on a, on a good track. And in the third phase, we identified and presented some countermeasures, what can we do to prevent, uh, uh, for example, students from trying to cheat on exam and proposed some features that needed to be implemented to, uh, have, to be able to toggle uh, these the possible threats. So one of the first uh, things we noticed after doing our analysis was that uh, there was no single uh, software or solution that was used uh, throughout universities uh, during critical academic activities like taking online examinations. So for example, some universities, they used uh, in-house developed learning management systems. So, they had their own software for managing the, the learning material and the examinations. Other universities, they had nationwide uh, learning management systems, while others they used uh, off-the-shelf solutions like Moodle, for example. Uh, what was uh, common in all uh, the three universities was that they've been using uh, learning management systems and they tried to adapt it uh, to the current situation. So they, they were attempting to find a solution to uh, keep going while the coronavirus was, uh, was a big problem. Now, in 
with regards to the uh, student identification process, uh, another thing we found was that the universities, <clears throat> they've been using tools for conducting meetings as well as for identifying students. And the most widely used uh, communication tools were uh, Microsoft Teams and Zoom. So I don't know if any one of you took an online examination during COVID, but the process was you had to present your face in a Zoom meeting or in a Teams meeting, and then hold your, your identity card next to you. That was the process of identifying students. And the other thing we found was that there were three main types of examinations that were being uh, uh, designed by the universities. The first one was the oral examination. So you will be in a meeting uh, with uh, your instructor and he or she would ask you some questions about the exam and you had to answer uh, using your voice. That was the first type. The second type was the written online type of exam in which you would log into a system online, a website, a web application. You will be presented with a series of either multiple choice or some text boxes in which you had to write your answers uh, digitally. And the third type of exam was the written hard copy in which you, you got the topics, the questions of the exam on your email or in some system, and you had to answer them in a hard copy. So you had to write your answers in the paper, then scan the papers using some software on your phone, and then submit these, uh, these hard copies to the, uh, to the system. So, Next, we identified some threat scenarios during online academic activities. So we split the process in two phases. So the first phase is when you initially want to join the examination. And in this case, uh, we refer to this as the student identity verification uh, uh, process and it's, <laughs> this step is initially before you join the exam as I said you have to show your face on the camera and present some sort of proof that it's you so let's say you hold your identity card and the other uh, phase is the examination phase so in this phase uh, we have the entire time of the examination, let's say if you have an exam that is two hours, then these two hours <clears throat> refers to the examination session. So what threats have we identified? So first of all, we have impersonation activities. So someone fakes his or her identity, pretends to be someone else, or uh, uh, or asks another person to show on the camera. So these scenarios, the impersonation could happen either in the first phase in the student identity verification, or it could also happen during the examination session. The other type of threats that we have identified includes uh, using forbidden communication or collaboration uh, tools, so either physically in person or remotely. So we had two subtypes of forbidden collaboration between students. The first one was the <clears throat> in situ, so in the place that the person, the student was taking the exam, there was another person or persons with them in the same place and helping them out with the exam. And the uh, second subtype of this forbidden communication and collaboration was the computer mediated. So people have been using 
their computer to access or speak or communicate or collaborate with other people, but they were not in the same place. They were communicating and collaborating remotely. And the third type of threat that we identified relates to forbidden access to material. So let's say you take an examination and you go and search on Google, on Stack Overflow, on ChatGPT, whatever, to find answers, which is against the policy of the university, obviously. And again, this could happen either uh, within the physical context or remotely. So you, let's say you could ask someone else to search it for you. <clears throat> so to give you a better uh, view on these uh, impersonation threat scenarios, in the first uh, uh, image, that was the threat in which a student fakes the identity proof. So they present wrong information. Let's say I, you give me your identity card. I, I am physically with you in the same place. I show your identity card and it's all good. I take the exam on your behalf, which is obviously uh, a problem. In the second image, <clears throat> we have first the student showing the, uh, their identity card. So they pass this student identity verification phase, the initial phase that you have to show your identity and your face. So you pass this phase and then there is another person in the room with you and you switch seats. So he takes over, continues with the exam, but the, let's say, the instructor didn't notice that this happened because if you have 100 people in a Zoom meeting or in a Teams meeting, it's technically impossible to see what's going on on each person's uh, screen. And the third type and the third image, sorry, we, again, we have passed uh, the initial phase uh, properly. We showed our uh, identity card, but there is another person in the same room and he or she provides me with some notes, some messages that are written on the paper and I can take a look at the answers and cheat on the exam. Moving on to the next type of uh, <clears throat> threat scenarios. Uh, as I said, we had the communication and collaboration or the access to forbidden resources. So in the first subtype of the computer mediated scenarios, uh, we found the thread in which uh, the person uh, that takes the exam uh, is communicating with someone else remotely either through the smartphone or a messaging application, or even with remote uh, tools like TeamViewer, which allow you to have access to another person's uh, computer and also control or provide input and so on. In the second, <clears throat> in the second scenario, uh, we have the case in which the student seeks for looks and tries to find answers uh, through search engines or <clears throat> uh, automated tools that provide uh, answers to questions that we ask. And apart from the computer mediated scenarios as part of the communication and collaboration threats, we also identified the in situ that happen in the physical place uh, of the student. And these threads involve, the first thread was someone else is there in the same place with you <clears throat> Sorry. and uh, he or she speaks to you. So they use their voice to tell you the answers without being in the, in the screen's range. So they cannot be seen by the instructor but they can still speak to you. Uh, the second uh, type was the interaction with someone uh, 
but again in the same room and it has a secondary uh, keyboard or mouse on connected on your on the student's device and they control the device and they provide answers and so on and the other thread that we identified this is a bit more creative and difficult to do but uh, was about uh, having another person in the same room doing the trying to help with the exam and providing the answers in a whiteboard through a projector so while i sit here and take the exam i also see back on the back of the scene the answers in a projector so so now that we've been through all the different threads that I just uh, described, I want you to think about four or five minutes. You can discuss with other people nearby if you want. How can we use intelligent biometrics to address these identified threads? So I'll give you a few minutes to think possible ways that we could use to tag all these threads. How can we use these intelligent biometrics, the face, the voice, or some other biometric data, for example, to be able to deal with all these kinds of threads? <laughs> I <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, please. For example, when we have a communication with our we will be able to have um, necessary the microphone activated. So the software of authentication hears what sort of noises come from the room the examiner is in. And that is easily blocked. However, in the case of physical context, the only thing I could think of was tracking the movements of the eye. However, that is possible as full of close because maybe someone who concentrates may have certain positions like this when they think. So I don't know if that's uh, <clears throat> yes, you are right on this. Uh, there is also the case of using eye tracking devices to capture this. But what you can do in that case, uh, it's not easy task, right? Uh, there is no straightforward solution. But in that case, what you can do is you can build a profile for each person. So if you, for example, like to think and stare on the right side or outside the window or whatever, then I will know that you, I will have a profile that matches your eye, eye gaze behavior and I will use that as extra information so I know that there is high chance that it is you. Uh, with the voice, yes, you are right. You need to have the microphone uh, uh, open, active and uh, use, capture what's being said in the room and then use some sort of 
uh, speech recognition algorithm and tools to uh, know whether it's you, whether it's you only, or whether it's multiple people, multiple voices in the same. Anyone else? Yes, you could even ask in Greek. <laughs> okay, let's see what we what we uh, managed to do so far from our uh, research project. <clears throat> so as we said, one of the key objectives of the project was to design an open source software toolkit that will deal with the privacy preservation of uh, intelligent biometrics for the purposes of student identity management in higher education institutions. So the key technical objectives were we had to implement <clears throat> some algorithms that continuously uh, identify a person based on a mixed approach of using their image data, their voice data, and their interaction data. But while doing so, we also had to have in mind that these models need to uh, take into consideration that they don't violate any privacy policies set by the university or the privacy of the people's data. <clears throat> So as part of design and development, we had to uh, create the open source identity <laughs> as a service solution, as well as design and develop an interactive dashboard <clears throat> that will uh, provide analytics, as well as it will uh, make the life of people that want to integrate it easier. So <clears throat> since you are uh, computer science students. Now we will show some more technical information about the implemented solution. So the high level uh, framework consists of a few components. First, on the left side of the screen, we had the Trust ID client, which is an application that is developed in both uh, Windows and Mac OS, uh, as Mac OS and Windows native application. So this uh, client application can be used by both the students and the instructors. Now on the top, we have the student view, what the student will see while interact with this uh, client application. So we have implemented some features for <clears throat> uh, being able to register your face and your voice biometrics. And I will show screens in a few minutes. Apart from the face and voice uh, registration, uh, there is also the possibility to integrate the existing learning management systems, for example, Moodle, that is being used by specific universities, it can be integrated and work with the client application. And from there, you can get access to, let's say, online examinations. Now, with regards to the features uh, to toggle the threat scenarios, the, the client application is able to, to do face and voice identification. So you have to enroll first your face and your voice, and then the system can ask you again for your face data, for your voice data, and be able to identify whether it's you or not, or whether it's one person and the particular person that had to be there, or whether there are also multiple people in the same way. Uh, other features include uh, monitoring the digital context, like what is going on on the 
digital context of the uh, person who is uh, taking an exam, as well as monitor the student's behavior, whether you are behaving uh, the way you had to, or whether you are doing anything that you are not supposed to do. Uh, other features include uh, uh, some handwriting styles analytics. So the way you type, for example, can be used to predict whether it's you or it's someone else that is writing on your keyboard. Now, from the instructor's point of view, the instructor, what they can do, they can log into the system, start the examination. <clears throat> uh, in case, uh, in, especially in the initial version, we had uh, we had a few problems with uh, some people not being able to be correctly identified by their face data. So we improved the algorithm as well as we added the option of uh, having like a fallback mechanism. So in case for whatever reason, your camera is broken, for example, or uh, something like that, then uh, you will get to another uh, a meeting with, uh, with the instructor, get some instructions, and they will be able to allow you to join the examination given that uh, they are sure it's you. Uh, also, we have some runtime insights. So while the exam is taking place, the instructor get, gets notifications on the screen. For example, someone uh, connected the secondary keyboard or someone uh, is not being uh, identified by their face data while the, the exam takes place. So you get some uh, analytics there, like 80% of the time, during the exam, it was uh, user number X, for example, while the 20 uh, remaining percent, it was someone else or, or it was no nobody there. Because there is a way to detect first <clears throat> whether there is any person in the image that you captured from the camera. Uh, that's from the client uh, side. From the server side, we had to also create uh, a backend that would allow the client to interact with the server. That's where we have a database where we store data information and so on. And on the right side, we also have some uh, LMS, existing LMS solutions. That's the learning management systems that are currently being used by uh, different universities. and. From this LMS, we also had to interact with them to get, for example, information from Moodle about which courses uh, each student is enrolled, which exams are being taken, will take place. So to integrate and combine what's in the one system to the other. Um, a few words about the technologies that we've used. So the server solution is a web application programming interface that is based on, uh, on Django framework, which is uh, a Python framework that is intended for creating web applications. So uh, for all this to work, uh, when you deploy an application, a web application, it's a good practice to always have uh, in front of your application uh, a web server. So for that purpose, we used uh, the Nginx. So when, when someone, let's say the client application tries to communicate with uh, the web application, the server, the backend side of things, then they first go through Nginx who can act as a as our web server and uh, load balancer. And then from the Nginx, the web server, to go to the Django web application, there has to be a, a way to uh, convert the, the request that arrived at the Nginx to something that Python can understand, the Django framework can understand. So for that purpose, we use the G Unicorn, uh, which is an application server that implements 
the web server gateway interface and allows us to connect the nginx to forward and convert uh, the data to something the types that the python django framework can understand uh, apart from these basic servers there was also a need uh, to handle tasks that are quite heavy and time consuming so for example when uh, image data arrive and you want to train a model that will predict or uh, you want to do something with the voice data that is usually uh, quite require some uh, take up some space and it will be a bit uh, delayed to process everything in near real time so for this kind of heavy tasks uh, we use uh, an asynchronous uh, task queue so you send a task the task is being queued asynchronously in a queue and then you reply back to the user that we received your request we are processing it and we will get back to you once we have uh, finished with it so without leaving the person uh, blocking the entire system so this allows for things to happen in the background without uh, blocking the interface and this uh, for this asynchronous task queue we've used the celery is a quite commonly used uh, task queue within Django applications and Celery uh, requires a message broker. So uh, it uses the idea of passing messages from the queue to the workers and, and so on. So for that message broker, we've used uh, uh, RabbitMQ is another software that uh, implements a message queuing protocol. Uh, as I said, we need we had to store data like what's going on in the system, uh, who's logged in at what time, uh, uh, who attempted to do a violation or so on. So for all these kind of monitoring and interaction data, uh, we need a database to store what's happening with the interactions between uh, the client and the server. So for that purpose, we've used the PostgreSQL, which is commonly used. It's a relational database, which is commonly used uh, with Django applications. And we took all these uh, different technologies and components, and we put them inside uh, another software with a set of tools and platform that is called Docker. So for that, uh, Docker technology uses uh, operating system level virtualization. So it allows you to uh, build all your different applications with all the libraries needed, all the code, everything that you need, you put them inside this uh, virtual uh, container, you package it and then you can run it in any place you want, you can put in any server that can run Docker, so it allows also for portability. Otherwise, you will have to install again everything. If you wanted to move from one server to another, then you will have to do everything again from scratch, but Docker makes this way easier. And it's a good tool if you want to experiment, even for your small projects, uh, it's a nice tool <coughs> to have in mind. So I'll show you a few screens about the, uh, the client application. So uh, that's how it looks like on a Windows uh, operating system. So it's like a software that runs on Windows and Mac OS, but this is uh, the screenshots from Windows. So you can use your email and password and select your organization, which university you belong. And once you log in, you will get a dashboard, which also shows you in which examinations you are enrolled, when is the next examination uh, uh, due, and so on, as well as uh, a screen for uh, managing your biometrics. So from that point, the biometric screen, you can register, uh, you can register your face by uh, opening your laptops or your computer's camera, 
it will capture a snapshot of your face and use this face to uh, generate your face models. So in, in this case, the, that's me trying to register my face biometrics in the system. Similarly for voice biometrics, I have to register also my voice data in the system. So I click a button, I speak a few words for a few seconds, my, cap, my voice is being captured, and then this uh, voice data is being converted and so on, and it ends up uh, in a, a voice recognition system. So after I finished with the enrollment of both my face and my voice, let's say I want to join an examination. So before I am able to join the examination and start uh, uh, writing my answers and so on, I have to be first identified by these intelligent biometrics algorithms. So again, I have to take a snapshot using the computer's camera of my face. So you click a button, it takes an image of yourself or whoever is sitting there. And then it will only allow you if it matches your face biometrics that you register. If there are many people in the room or if there is nobody in the camera's frame, then you will not be able to proceed. Same with the voice. You have to speak again in the microphone, say something for a few seconds, and we'll compare what you said now, the, your voice biometrics with the voice biometrics that we enrolled in the previous stage. And uh, uh, apart from face and voice, we have also implemented some uh, checkup of running processes and software, which applications are run while you take the examination on your, or your computer. So for example, if you have some communication tools open, let's say TeamViewer or whatever, some browsers and so on, then you will not be able to join the exam unless you first close each of these communication or collaboration tools. And if all of these scenarios go well, then you are allowed to join the exam and start either writing your answers or speaking uh, in an oral examination. And as I said in the beginning, we wanted a way to continuously monitor what, what's going on in the student's uh, uh, physical context and digital context. So these algorithms also run uh, in the background. There is a continuous manner of taking snapshots every couple of uh, seconds and uh, taking uh, recordings of what is being spoken while the person is. So both face and voice and the, the checkup of the communication and collaboration tools is also happening throughout the examination session. And in the end, you get some percentages. As I said previously, 80% of the time it was this person or it was this person speaking or he or she, uh, opened some forbidden communication tools. So a few more uh, screenshots, that's the application programming interface. This is what is exposed by the server in terms of allowing the client applications to communicate with. So it provides us uh, the, the URL with which we can communicate and what kind of uh, input data we can send and what kind of uh, response we will get back in case things went well or in case an error happened. So it's like, uh, and there is also a documentation. So you can see, for example, when you try to log into the system, you will need to send uh, your username, your password, and there is a list of possible uh, response codes that you will get back, let's say 200 if everything went well or uh, 401 if you provided wrong details and so on. Now, a few things 
uh, about the face recognition component. Uh, so uh, for a face recognition algorithm to work, uh, it's not that straightforward. You need to do some processing first. So you let's say you get this snapshot of the camera. You, you, you take a photo from the laptop's camera. Uh, you need to do some initial processing on the camera. The first thing you need to do is you need to detect at which part of the image there is a face or multiple faces. And uh, why is this important, you think? Because we don't care about the remaining uh, pixels on the image. We only care whether where the face is located. So one of the first steps we do, we have to first detect where, where there is the face. Then we need to do some warping, some blurring of the image to extract the uh, a region of interest. Uh, once we have this phase data, we need to convert it to, some, to something that uh, machine learning or uh, uh, deep neural network uh, can understand, which is usually uh, numbers. So uh, we need to do some sort of normalization on the data and then uh, provide this normalized data in a convolutional neural network that will do the prediction for us and will provide us a predicted identity. So in that case, it was uh, James Bond, which was the actor Daniel Gregg. So the system is able to, the face recognition system can find these similarities because he, the system knew that uh, based on the predictions, it's more likely to be uh, this particular person with this uh, amount of confidence. Usually the confidence is between zero and one or can be a percentage. So you will get a response back like 0 0.89 or 0 0.9 out of one is the prediction that this image, in this image, the person is, uh, let's say, Daniel Gray. Now, uh, in a similar manner with the voice uh, component that we uh, implemented. So again, when you capture the voice from the microphone, you capture and let's say an audio file or a recording of what has been uh, spoken, what's being said during that time. But the, uh, the algorithms that are used for intelligent biometrics need a way to process numbers. So we have first to convert these uh, signals, the, the audio must be converted to something that these uh, algorithms, the machine learning or the classifiers can understand. Uh, so for that, there is some, again, some sort of pre-processing to convert it, to extract the embeddings of the uh, voice data. So these embeddings, you can think of them as, a, as arrays of numbers. And then when you register the voice, initially it goes to a speaker database. And then when you want to do comparisons, it will compare the new voice sample with this speaker database. and I, take a decision and present like a result. Like again, it will give you a score from uh, zero to one with the predicted uh, speaker uh, identity. And for that, I'll, for the voice base, there are quite a few uh, state-of-the-art uh, libraries. One of them is Caldi, which is written in C++. Uh, there is also VoiceSense, which offers voice biometric solutions. And uh, uh, one quite well performing is a speech brain, which is uh, developed in Python. In our case, we've used the, the speech brain and we did all this processing and so on. And the, the training of the, based on the voice we received and also, this is used while we do the identification or the continuous monitoring. Now, 
uh, one of the uh, latest uh, things that we've been working on relates to keystroke dynamics. The keystroke dynamics is, is uh, the way that we type on the keyboard. And we are experimenting with uh, the implementation of a, a keystroke dynamics uh, biometric. So uh, for that, we use uh, a random forest classifier, which ensembles uh, learning methods for classification and uses multiple decision trees to classify whether what you write is accurately enough with what you were supposed the, the way you were supposed to write. So uh, for that, we use uh, some features to train it. And these features include, uh, for example, the whole time is how much time usually is in milliseconds is uh, when you hold a button, when you press it and it's pressed down. There is also the release release time is when you type two consecutive uh, uh, letters on the keyboard by is the amount of time between the release of one and the release of the second. There is also release press time, which is how much time elapsed by the time you released the first and you press the next. And the press press time is uh, the total amount of time between two consecutive button, uh, uh, button or letters, whatever you wrote, the time you press the first until the time you press the second. So we take all these timing events, we train a classifier and we make a prediction like uh, with this accuracy again between zero and one, we believe that this typing behavior matches or not the, the person supposed behavior. Now, obviously all these, uh, all these, uh, Features that we implemented rely on, as I said, physiological and behavioral biometrics. So here we have some challenges with what we do about the privacy preservation. How do we preserve the privacy of the of this biometric data that we have? So a few things first, a few challenges is that first of all, these biometric data are not always secret. And what we mean by that is, for example, your fingerprints can be extracted from something that you touched previously. So if I touch this bottle and leave it here, then you might be able to grab some uh, residuals of my fingerprints. Or uh, I can find uh, a lot of face data from social media or publicly online available. So I can record the voice of someone and try to use it uh, to cheat the system or to get access to some, some service or software. Also, uh, the biometrics can reveal information and expose sensitive data about, let's say, some people's uh, ethnicity or whether they have bad health conditions and so on. And one of the most important things is that uh, the biometrics, unlike our passwords or our, uh, let's say credit cards or debit cards or whatever, if we lose or if we forget our passwords or if they are compromised, or if we lose our card, for example, we can go to the bank and cancel it and request a new one. But if our biometrics are compromised, I cannot change my fingerprint. I cannot change my face. And, and so, so it's more, it needs uh, a lot of, uh, uh, it, it needs a lot of um, work to be done to make sure that uh, these biometrics will not be compromised. So what we envisioned in, as part of the project was that uh, we can uh, give the control of the biometrics management back to each user. So the student will be responsible and will have full control over their biometrics. So they will be able to uh, update them, delete them, do whatever they want. And only 
provide them, like share them with the university when it's really needed. So uh, the university doesn't need to have, let's say my phase model for the whole type. It's only needed while I take a critical academic activity. Let's say I want to take an exam. So my phase model, my voice model, my interaction, keystroke dynamics model needs to be uh, used while I take an exam. So uh, what, what, we, uh, what we came up with was when you register from the client application, your phase model, we implemented a wallet like a mobile application that will be used to store and uh, give control to each student to their biometrics. So the phase model, the voice model, the interaction, the keystroke dynamics model is generated. Then you get a QR code on your screen on the client application. You scan this from the wallet mobile application your models are being transferred to your device and then are deleted from the server. So you have full control uh, in a privacy preserving way over your data. So your biometrics are with you. And then this is done, uh, these two screens are from the mobile application. So you scan the QR on the screen of the Windows or Mac OS application and you get your models uh, locally on your on your wallet, and then when you want to join the exam, uh, because if you remember to join the exam, you first have to identify based on your face, based on your voice, based on your typing behavior. So at that point, the system will ask you to approve whether you want your biometrics to be transferred to the university for the time of the examination and you get a push notification on your wallet application saying that you need to provide your, uh, to share your biometric models to join the exam and uh, you approve it, your models have been transferred and are being used during the exam. Uh, if you'd like to find out more information about this project, uh, you can uh, visit our uh, website uh, trustid-project.eu <laughs> and uh, before we wrap up uh, I would like to uh, to invite you to contribute to our project and help us because you know when you when you are working especially in research projects you need a lot of contribution from people that will interact with the system uh, find the possible flaws of the system, give you their feedback and so on. So uh, if you would like to participate and contribute to our efforts in this uh, biometric, uh, 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 intelligent biometric solution, you can scan this QR code from your phone now and you can put your name, your email, and we will, you will receive uh, a confirmation email and we will get back to you uh, in the next few days to uh, give you more details about uh, our user studies that are taking place now and if you would like to volunteer uh, even as uh, just to get an idea how research is performed and uh, with that I would like to ah, go back to scan first <laughs>